Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about regularization. So regularization is a technique we use to overcome overfitting. And depending on the type of algorithm that we're using, it can take various forms. So for example, in the case of linear regression, as well as generalized linear models, it might take on the form of the addition of a penalty term. In the case of a decision tree, it might take the form of pruning of a decision tree. The deeper the tree, the more chance there is that it will be too catered to your training data. And so any small changes in your training data would lead to difference in tree structure. And so a smaller tree would be able to better generalize on different, slightly different types of data a little better. And then we have neural networks where regularization is often done in the form of dropout, where we often have some neurons that are randomly switched off in order for the neural network to learn just along different paths. And so it is also better able to generalize and doesn't get stuck in memorizing very specific training examples. Now, in this video, we're going to more focus on this additional penalty term that we see in the context of linear regression. So now let's try to see if we can perform some sort of polynomial regression. And the goal here is to minimize the residual sum of squares. Now, what we expect to happen when drawing a curve through a cloud of data points is a curve that looks something like this. It kind of just goes to the data points, but doesn't exactly touch every single data point. However, what we might actually get is probably something that looks like this. Why do we get the green line instead is because, well, our goal is just to minimize the residual sum of squares. And this green line actually say has a smaller residual sum of squares than the yellow line, which we wanted. But the problem with the green line is that it could potentially be overfitting the data. And so it doesn't generalize too well. The reason this happens is primarily because each of these theta terms are not constrained to be any value when they try to minimize the residual sum of squares. And because of that, it can take on any complex function in order to just achieve the overarching goal of minimizing the residual sum of squares. To kind of build a better intuition of like why this is an issue, we have this really simple line over here that's of a simple form of y is equal to your typical mx plus c. And if we add like a square term, you'll see that the line now becomes curved. In other words, it becomes a little more complex. And if we add a cube term, we see that the line bends in multiple places, and so it becomes even more complex. And so you can see how just adding multiple terms can just increase the entire complexity of the system. Also, if you kind of increase the value of like these parameters, let's say we increase a little bit, you can see that the slopes of all of these lines are now so much higher, which means that small changes in the x direction leads to larger changes in the y direction. And this causes the high variance issue that we see that kind of defines overfitting. So in order to combat this, like we mentioned before, we want to add some constraints to the theta parameters when computing the residual sum of squares or trying to minimize it. Let's say that we want to perform some linear regression on just two features, x1 and x2, that have corresponding coefficients, theta1 and theta2. And if we just do the minimization of the residual sum of squares, we might see that the minimum is somewhere up here with a very high theta2 value and a very high theta1 value. Let's now add a little constraint where we want the theta1 value and theta2 value to be very small. Let's say that it, we want it to be in this region here that's defined by this circle. In math notation, this is equivalent to minimizing the RSS such that your theta1 squared plus theta2 squared is going to be less than or equal to some value s. This is the equation of a circle and that's why we've written it geometrically as such. Now, in order to show how we can project the value of RSS within this constrained region, I'm going to use a graph called a contour plot. So contour plots, in this case, it's going to be a three-dimensional chart where we have x-axis and y-axis to be the coefficients, but then you'll have like another z-axis that comes out of the screen and that will be proportional to the actual loss or the cost. In this case, it's going to be 
uh, the residual sum of squares. In order to actually draw the z-axis, because it's hard to draw on paper, we would represent it with contours. So for example, one contour would look like this, and then maybe, you know, in a slightly higher elevation, we'll have a contour that looks like this. And then a slightly even higher elevation, we'll probably have a contour that looks like this. And then in the highest elevation, we'll say we have a contour that looks like this. Now, what this means here is at the minimum, maybe the R residual sum of squares is some number like 20. But then in everywhere along this blue curve, the residual sum of squares, let's say that it is 30. And everywhere along this green curve, let's say it's 50 or something. And everywhere along this yellow curve, it's 55. Everywhere along the red curve, it's like 57. You can kind of think of this as looking top down into a valley where the deepest part is this blue region and it just gets taller and taller to like a taller mountain on this red region. And the height of these mountains or the depth of these valleys is proportional to these residual sum of square values. And what our goal is is to find the minimum value of the residual sum of squares that fall within this region it's probably going to be somewhere along like this point over here. This formulation of using a circle to map the values of theta one and theta two using this constraint is ridge regression. In order to get lasso, all we do is just change the constraint that we're optimizing against. Instead of making it in the circle, we might wanna make it in this diamond. Mathematically, this means that in order to minimize the residual sum of squares, we want to do that such that the absolute value of theta one plus the absolute value of theta two is going to be less than or equal to some s. One interesting property that we kind of see with lasso over the ridge regression is that the values of theta one or theta two may actually absolutely become zero, whereas that of ridge regression are not actually zero, but they're, they are a value that's typically very close to zero. Up here, I have the loss with the residual sum of squares along with the ridge regression penalty. And the way that we actually bubble up from the constraints into the equation itself is through a constraint optimization technique that I'll link down in the description below. But in order to get some intuition of why lasso can be zero and why ridge is typically near zero, I wanna consider a very simple case. So first, let theta zero be equal to zero. So that means that there's no intercept term. Let's also consider only one example where n is equal to one, and also the feature value that we're injecting is just one. And so now the ridge regression equation bubbles down to just this form. And in order to minimize this, as we would with the residual sum of squares, we take the derivative of theta one with respect to zero, and then we find that theta one actually has this nice little form which is a very simplistic form that shows a line. Let's do the same exact thing for lasso where we're coming up with a few equations of this form here. Now, given those formulations, let's now gain some intuition. The ridge regression equation represents now this line where the y, this x-axis is going to be a response variable, so it's going to be y, and the y-axis is going to be the value of the coefficient. And these three equations over here are representations for lasso. So I'm gonna turn them on so they are all coming here and going up. This L term over here is the lambda. Now when lambda is equal to zero, the Y term is going to be equal to the coefficient itself. And this is the residual sum of squares estimate as well. So there is no kind of regularization that's going on when lambda is equal to zero. But as lambda increases, you'll actually notice something here. So for one, this red line represents the ridge regression of how, what is the value of the coefficients as we increase lambda. You can see that it only touches the x-axis. It only becomes zero at, well, literally just one point. But for lasso, which follows this piecewise linear route, you see that the, as lambda increases, there is a large period here where the value of the coefficient is zero. And so as you go on increasing lambda, you can see that you will have more and more coefficients get the value of zero. 
Whereas with ridge regression, the values don't become zero, but they, as you increase the lambda, they tend to be zero more and more because the y-axis is the coefficients. You can see that they're closer and closer to the value of zero. I'm gonna now end this video by looking at ridge regression and lasso from a Bayesian lens. Now, what this involves is to set up some form of prior belief. What do I believe the value of the theta term is before I even see my training data? Well, before we set that up as constraints that are just close to some value zero. In this case, I'm gonna set up a prior distribution. In which case, let's assume that, you know, the values of theta one are gonna be something really small, or I believe that they should be something small. And it's going to be basically a normal distribution, is what I'm assuming, around the value zero. And so, what we wanna now find is a posterior. This here is the posterior distribution. And this is proportional to the likelihood times the prior. Now, the likelihood here, this is kind of similar to what we do in maximum likelihood estimation, and this here is a normal distribution. This also here, this prior, is also a normal distribution because we've assumed that. It's a normal distribution of mean zero. And if you do a simplification here, you'll see that you'll actually land at the same ridge regression formulation. Now, with lasso, it's almost exactly the same steps that we do. The only difference is the prior that we're considering. In this case, we are considering a double exponential prior for how we think the distribution of our theta one is. This is the probability density function for a double exponential prior. And so we have the likelihood term, which is this term over here. And then we also have a prior term, which will be this term over here. And doing the simplification, we end up with the exact same lasso penalty here. So I hope this actually gives you a good intuition from a Bayesian standpoint of how we're looking at the same problem and you can actually arrive at the same solution. And that's all I have for this video. If you liked the video, please do like, comment, and subscribe. And if you found something that was a little incorrect or you might have your own opinions and thoughts on these things, please don't hesitate to comment down below. I'm trying to go to a community here of education nerds and we are doing pretty well, I'd like to think. Well. See you soon. Bye-bye.